So here in Netherlands, at your, the Netherlands office for GDK Software, that, I guess, is this the worldwide headquarters? Would that I be? think so, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. We are here with around 18 people or so. So this is... Uh, What's the, the total number of developers now? It's just gone cool. up again, didn't it? It did. Uh, it's over 30, maybe 35 or so. I can, actually, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we almost need like a little a, a counter. A counter, that, yeah, yeah. That would be great. A yeah, dashboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, now, 30, 35, something like that. Worldwide, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Which is great. Well, we. Uh, I think every time I, I go to, to Brazil, I see new faces there because ah, there are so many Delphi de good Delphi developers there as well. So it is. We tend to expand quite a lot in uh, in Brazil. Yeah. I love where so I remember where it was. Some, we were in a webinar like that, and you mentioned that our expansion in Brazil is not like driven by like oh cheap developers. It's more like no. wow, these are good developers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's so much knowledge out there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's the, the so they also invest quite a lot in in great libraries. Uh, they have good developers there, um, a good teaching system. So yeah, I really like the developers there, absolutely. And uh, interestingly, when Stack Overflow, the first Stack Overflow introduced for other languages was for Brazilian Portuguese. Oh really? Yes. Huh, didn't know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it makes sense. It does. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge country. You have a lot of developers, but also a lot of good developers. Yes. So yep. Yeah. And that, okay. on, that was one of the things that I really loved about when I was first talking with you about working with GDK when you had, you had an office in Brazil. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, because mm. that's something when, at a Mercadero yeah. when I go to Brazil, I'm like, there are a lot of <laughs> yeah. really good, yeah. really passionate developers here. Absolutely, yeah. And so, so you had, I think last month it was, uh, you had the Mercadero conference in Sao Paulo. Yes. 700, over 700 developers. Yeah. All together there, well, that's great, yeah. Well, yeah, and that's crazy. your comment about how big Brazil is, and that's something I didn't really get until I started traveling there, is Brazil is roughly the same geographically sized as the United States. Yes. Which, yeah. yeah. You don't it, realize. Uh, yeah, exactly. The maps doesn't um, do good to Brazil because it's on the southern hemisphere, so in near the equator. Yeah, <sighs> exactly. Yeah, so you have these these real size maps. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. So if you drag Brazil up onto the U.S. or Europe, then it's huge. Yes. Yeah, then you, you yep. see the the size of it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, thirty five developers, something like that. Yeah, and still growing, which is good. So we had the company days just this last week. Yes. That was awesome as well. It Oxford. was. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, I'd been looking forward to it for a while. This is my first company day. So yeah. 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 Have you been in Oxford before? or? I would not. That was my okay. first time to UK even. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, awesome. Yeah. Now, I think it was, uh, well, uh, I think I said before, it's not really the location that matters. It's connecting to the, all the, the developers from worldwide that, that are together. Um, and yeah. Well, you've seen this. Uh, how, how was your first experience? It was really good. I, I wasn't quite sure exactly what to expect, honestly, because mm -hmm. I've worked other places that we'd get like, um, that were large companies and we'd have like a, um, a meeting where everybody comes together, but it was just like boring, all <laughs> topics discussion, you know, very focused yeah. and, and it was really hard to, um, it could have been a, you know, the whole joke about an email could have been a, a, yeah. a, a meeting a could have been, could an, have been email. an email. This could have been a, a, an email or a video. <laughs> yeah. And th yeah. there was very little of the interaction with other people. And I think that's really important. Yes. That, the, that part of it. Yeah. Well, of course, we do have partly like, like the, uh, the stuff we did on Friday morning um, when we talked about code and about, uh, well, the Delphi developer quiz, which was nice as well. Yeah. Which you won, by the way, which fits. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it, indeed, so for the rest of the program, it's just really uh, talking to each other and connecting to, to other people because, yeah, we are living in, in the Netherlands, you in the US, we have a Brazil office, a UK office. Um, usually you only see each other via Teams and um, meeting every, um, persons real life, that's really a difference. Mm -hmm. um, really right. to connect, yeah. Yeah, and I had a lot of just you know, good conversations would be walking along and the person next to we start talking about, it's like, oh, you're, oh, God, you know, that's really cool. Yeah. And we'd get into interesting co conversations, topics, some of it related to development, some of, a lot of it not, but yeah. that you just discover these mm -hmm. um, commonalities and things that you yeah. wouldn't get over Teams. Exactly, no. You know. no. Teams is always more straightforward and just to the point, which is good, but um, yeah, if you're colleagues, then a meeting in, in real life is, uh, is even better, yeah. It's, I think from a, a business point of view, I think the, the, 
getting people to know each other better makes it easier for them to collaborate. But I think it probably yeah. is like a big part of like retention too, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we always joke that every, every year the accountant says, okay, ah, this is so expensive, why do you do this? And I say, do you know how much it costs to, um, uh, to have someone learn how we'd like to work? Uh, how much does it cost to, um, uh, how do you say this, set out a, a new um, vacancy, let's say, for, right. for a new, new job? Uh, how much time does it cost to interview all these people, to teach them how we'd like to work and, and what we think is good? Um, compare that to all the costs we spend for the company days and for all the other, the other stuff we do, it's, it's a small cost. It's an investment in the people we really like and we love and, and yeah, um, it's expensive, but still, yeah, and we, then we like it, to do that. Yeah, the having that, because even if you hire like the best developer, there's still some time, like you said, them learning the, how we like to do things, the yeah. GDK way. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, and it, it's not just a development side of things, right? So we also like to, to have people that can communicate and that can talk to each other and these kind of events will help with that as well. Just you know each other, you know everyone is approachable, so um, if someone wants to, to ask me something, that's just possible, why not? Mm -hmm. So and all these events help to connect, uh, to connect with each other. And I think that was, so that's the company day of course that we have within our own, um, uh, own company, but the, the Delphi Summit was also a, an awesome event to do that, not only with our company, but with all Delphi developers from all over the world. Yeah. That was, um, well, I don't know how you uh, look back at that, but um, I was surprised by the, the amount of people and um, the enthusiasm from everyone. There, yeah, yeah I, Delphi Summit was really, really good. And I t a lot, there, there were a lot of people there that I'd worked with online for years mm -hmm. and had never met, and I met yeah. them in person there, and um, been people that I've seen around at other events. And everybody seemed to really think it was a great event yeah. and uh, were very enthusiastic about it. But th yeah, that um, being there in person mm -hmm. and having conversations and stuff, like Stefan Glinky was there, yeah. and I, I used his code, I've known him <laughs> online for years, but never met him in person. Yeah. Exactly. And meeting him in person, it's like, oh, yeah. you're in. Oh, I'm in the path role playing games and blah blah. Yeah. And we start talking about all sorts of topics, and then yeah. we'd circle back around and talk about some of the Delphi stuff. Yeah. And then we've, yeah. So it's 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 great from yeah. And we're doing it again, right? Delphi we, Summit. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're doing it again. Um, uh, the date we don't know yet wh exactly when, but um, yeah, this was a, an event worth uh, repeating. So absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So some other topics. What do we want to add? Well, let's, let's talk about your book. It's yes. right here. Um, the fascinating history of Delphi and Pascal: Pioneering Simplicity. Uh, I love the backstory of why you wrote this book. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was quite a journey, and indeed, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that was, uh, where to start with that? I think it was uh, almost two years ago when I, I was researching a little bit about the history of Delphi and Pascal and thinking, okay, this is something that uh, we could turn into a blog post for our website, for the knowledge base. Um, and then I did some research and there was so much information and it was scattered all over the place. And start, I started writing and then it became longer and longer and longer. And before you know, you think, ah, wait, this is not something for just a couple of blog posts. This is bigger than that. Um, mm -hmm. And after quite a few interviews and, and um, quite a few evenings spent uh, writing, uh, we now have a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, it's interesting. So about two years ago, I was had the same thought that this was, I think, a a story that needed to be told. Yeah. And because there's so much stuff that was pioneered in this ecosystem that yeah. has had big, broad oh, impact yeah, across absolutely. the industry that people aren't aware of. Yeah. Um, indeed, but if, you, if you go back from, from the start, like from Pascal, indeed, mm -hmm. uh, you see all kinds of references to the, the, the ideas that came in, in the, at the start of, of Pascal through all the other languages. I think like Go, and there are multiple more that are mm -hmm. sort of based on the, the ideas on, uh, of, of Pascal itself. Um, and of course, um, uh, Anders Helsberg created not only 
Pascal and Delphi, the, the, the Turbo Pascal compiler, but also later uh, TypeScript, uh, C Sharp. Well, and it all has some, some of the ideas of the simplicity of uh, Pascal and Delphi. And mm -hmm. I think it's a great story to, to, to tell indeed if you go back from really the beginning. And it, and it is, what is it now, um, more than 50 years ago before we had the first version of Pascal or the, the, the language itself. Um, it's quite a story, and uh, indeed, if you if you go go back, uh, well, I start at a book. I start with Blas Pascal, of course, because uh -huh. yeah. Um, Wait, I thought I did like that you went back. You started with Blas Pascal. Yes, yeah. Well, he is he's of course the the um, inventor of a lot of things, uh, like the Pascaline, for example. That's mm -hmm. the, the first uh, mechanical calculator. Um, he's of, of course well known for a lot of a lot of other things as well for for his. Um, uh, philosophical and, and religious works, uh, but he was indeed a, a mathematician and an inventor. And it's fun to see like these all these stories about um, the the Pascaline that some of them are sort of repeating in recent history. He had problems uh, with other people copying his Pascaline, his mechanical calculator as well. Mm -hmm. um, although back then there were quite bad copies, but still you had the sort of the same front end. So. Uh, he had something to do with copywriting his system. He got a uh, patent for, for uh, his system as well, uh, but also explaining how a system works and uh, the, the whole marketing stuff around it. But I think it's, it's great to see that, uh, that it started, well, in the 16, uh, 1600s. Mm -hmm. And I love the thing, actually, you talked about with uh, Worth about the um he specifically called out that he, everybody, a, lot of, a lot of people say that Delphi or Pascal was created as an educational language, but that wasn't the only goal. Exactly. It yeah. was to make a, a good productivity, a good uh, language for building applications with. Yeah, and for large applications. For large well. applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, we see like TypeScript versus JavaScript is kind of this idea of JavaScript was um, designed just to be this flexible, like add a little bit of functionality mm -hmm. in, but then they're like, oh, when you start to build these big applications, you need to have some more structure. Yes. And so TypeScript, I mean, it pulls from a lot of things, but a lot of the stuff it imposes on JavaScript mm -hmm. is similar to things that we see in, Turo, in Pascal and Delphi. Yes. This um, making it easier to work with your code, that it's more maintainable over yeah. long term. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Stricter, but so, yes. so simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, indeed, but but really strong in still creating these large applications. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that is indeed contrary to, to what many people believe. It's not designed for just teaching. Uh, in the first paper he published in the um, in the sci scientific uh, um, journal, he explicitly said it's for teaching and for building large programs. So. Uh, exactly. That that is uh, what he had in mind when when designing the language. And of course, it was based on Algol uh, for mm -hmm. a part, but he added a lot of things to make it simpler and to make it more strict. And he removed some stuff as well. The only thing I'm I'm still wondering why he didn't do that is um, removing the go-to statement, because <laughs> he described the go-to statement in. Well, I know why, uh, but. Uh, because he didn't dare, I think th that was what he explained, he didn't dare to remove it because he wanted to have all these, these Algo developers coming over and he, he was thinking that they would miss a go-to statement. But in hindsight, he told, I think in, in, in an interview in, in 2013, uh, in hindsight, he would have left it, left it out because it's still, yeah. Well, we all know what a go-to statement does. And, um, yeah. One of the other things I, w I, w I found in the, um, in the original description of the language Pascal is that he had a list of compiler uh, warnings and errors, uh -huh. uh, which is great. I think some of them are still familiar, some of them aren't. And one of them I found was that uh, he had a compiler error in there uh, saying procedure too long. I was going to ask, I was going to bring into that, right? Yeah. I, that is great. It, yeah. And um, I, I think is I think still uh, if you would introduce these for new applications at least it would improve your code. So okay, you can't have a procedure this long because yeah, you know what it is if you if you uh, follow the clean code rules or if you want to have readable code, yeah, don't make the procedures or functions too long. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I don't know how long too long was for him, but. 
what what I do know is that he he followed some of the the rules for clean code, although they, they were written way la uh, uh, later in history. But um, he also turned down a lot of uh, his students' code because there was too many commands in it. So if you ha if you needed a lot of commands to ex oh. to explain oh. your code, you're not coding well. No, that makes that, sense. That was what he said, at least. Makes yeah. sense. So it was uh, fun to, to dive into. Yeah. One of the other things I really didn't know before I started writing was way later when you had Turbo Pascal, the first versions, why it was such a success. Because they were um, back in, in the early uh, 1980s, there were a lot of Pascal compilers. I didn't know that either, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, but I think they had tens or, or 20, maybe over 20 Pascal uh, compilers for CPM and for DOS systems uh, and even for uh, uh, later for the Apple. Um, but they were all, and that's what I found out, they were all really slow because of the interpreted way they work with the, the, the P code. Right. Um, and maybe if, if someone is a bit older, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I didn't know how that worked. So um that that has quite a history as well the, the the p code was sort of the interpreted way of running pascal code like like java basically um, and it came about because back in the days you started with uh, pascal on a mainframe which was of course a large system you had the, these punch cards to to program and then if you wanted to translate your pascal compiler to another mainframe you had to basically rewrite everything. So it was quite a, quite a lot of work here. So you had to bootstrap the compiler. So first write, mm. write some stuff in the original way the, the in machine code usually for a large mainframe. Then once you got a, um, a functional compiler, at least partly, then you, got, uh, you, you can compile with the compiler that you created. So right. bootstrapping the thing. Um, what I did, uh, and that was the UCSD Pascal version, what I did for uh, microcomputers was having a sort of way to um, to create P code, which is in non-existing machine code language. Uh, and with that language was sort of an in intermediate layer. You can then, you then had to, to implement just a few machine instructions and you could run your Pascal compiler on top of, of that. Mm -hmm. So it was a sort of interpreted way of compiling your, uh, your Pascal programs. Uh, the only problem with that is it's slow. Right. Yeah. Um, and Anders Helsberg, he didn't use the P code compiler. What he did was, that, so they sold, well, it's, it's all in the book there as well, but they sold computers in Denmark. And these were these, these NESCOM computers. Mm -hmm. I think later they were called uh, Lucas computers. Mm. But they didn't have an um, operating system on there. So what he did, he wrote his own operating system, but also his own compiler in Pascal in assembly, because he did, there was not too much uh, memory in there, so he had to keep it as small as possible. And to do that, he wrote everything in assembly. And because he did that and not using the P code, it was way faster than all the existing um, Pascal compilers back then. So that meant that you, uh, with the, the, the Turbo Pascal compiler he wrote, it was called Compass Pascal and Poly Pascal at, at first, but later it was, uh, was Turbo Pascal. If you compiled a example program with the, the existing compilers, it could take one and a half minutes or two minutes. Sometimes you had to, a two-pass compiler where you had to switch uh, floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that was horrible. So sometimes it took a, a lot of time just with this example program. It, I think it took one and a half minutes with the usual compilers. And with Turbo Pascal, it was under a second. So it was so much faster. It was almost a no-brainer to buy the Turbo Pascal um, first when it came out. And I think another thing they did really well, of course, was price it a little bit different. So all the mm -hmm. Pascal compilers were priced around $500. Uh, Turbo Pascal was um, uh, $49, right. including a manual. So just even the manual was worth the price. Yeah. So basically it was a no-brainer. But a couple of these things were really surprising to me that there were already so many Pascal compilers out there. Um, and then researching why Turbo Pascal was really the making a difference uh, was was a fun thing to uh, to see as well. So many fun stories as well, like like the ones that uh, um, about about Philip Kahn uh, selling his first um, advertisement to the to, to oh, the Byte magazine. Yep, that was a good one. That, that was a good one as well. Yeah, yeah. I won't I won't tell it here. You have to read the book, but it's it's um, it's fun. Yeah. 
And well, of course, you can find this online as well, but why, why they called it Delphi? The, the pro product Delphi, you probably know this. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But that was a fun story as well, that they first, first came up with, well, the, 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 the story is quite big, but first came up with the name Oracle, uh, because they were talking about databases, etc., and then they thought, "Ah, wait, uh, Oracle. It's also a company, so yeah. it's difficult to do that." They had other names as well, like um, App uh, Wasabi, App Builder, yeah. uh, even Visual Basic Killer. Yes. Um, but someone came up with the idea: okay, if you want to talk to an Oracle, uh, you have to go to Delphi, yeah. and that's why Delphi came uh, came along. And if I remember correctly, they were like really like they didn't want to use that. Oh name. no. Not at all. And but then it just it was the it one stuck. that stuck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they they send out I think in 1994 they send out all these uh, test versions to to the uh, to the magazines, and I think it was called Delphi 95 or so, um, but that was still a code name mm -hmm. they they talked about indeed. And then um, because the marketing people weren't really happy with the Delphi name, mm -hmm. because yeah, Delphi is a well known name. It's a city. It's it's a place. So ah, how do you differentiate? Um, between the place and the, and the product, uh, but then indeed the, the the name stick around, and one of the the names that got the most traction was App Builder indeed. Mm -hmm. um, but right before they needed to make a decision, do we go for Delphi or App Builder? Um, another company, and I forget forgot the name who it was, uh, but came out with a product named App Builder. So that was out of the way, and then there was realistically one just one name left, um, which was Delphi. Well, that, that's kind of interesting um, from a product naming, trademarking point of view. <laughs> so, like, Amazon is a good example of a, a strong trademark. Even though Amazon is a yeah. river, yes. it doesn't have anything to do with online marketplace. Yeah. Then you, like, have yeah. uh, somebody else. A, a weaker trademark would be something that's descriptive of what it is. Yes. So, App Builder is a descriptive trademark. Exactly. But, you anyway. know. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, this is, who's the target audience for this? Is Is it? Anybody well, that's in software development, or <laughs> it's of course anybody who has something to do, I think, with Delphi and Pascal, it, it will be interested in this because it's mm -hmm. um, uh, a history of the, one of the or, or both of the languages that that you, as a Delphi developer or Pascal developer, know best. And um, but it's I think for every software developer, it's it's a great read because you see how the development of such a language goes and what the history and the the um, <laughs> How do you say this? The, the creativity around such uh, a language creation is, and I think that's a great read. But especially if you ever have used Delphi, um, yeah, it's it's um, absolutely for for me as well. But because writing it, I didn't know much about it. Um, so writing only only writing it, it was quite a journey. I think it took two years. Uh, but now I. I it it always takes a while before you get this a, a physical one, you know. So mm -hmm. so I was ready with this, I think, in April or May or so, and then I left left it around. To, you had to do the editor and and the, the layout and design part, etc. And then I got it again, read through it, and I thought, ah, oh, th this is interesting. So um, <laughs> <laughs> even myself, I, I think, okay, yeah, um, I like the book. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah that's good. It, it's that's a, good. it's an interesting story. Yeah. So. Um, it, I, I was surprised yeah. there's there's not a lot of code in there, right? So it's not, uh, not at all, I think. <laughs> even. Yeah, I don't think well, uh, there's maybe some small example. No, I don't yes. think so. No, it's it's really the story about yes. uh, about oh, wait. Pascal. There's if then or <laughs> uh, there, yeah, there are a couple of lines, but a couple that's of it. lines, but no, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. which is I think is cool it, or is good. It makes it um, accessible. You don't have to be a programmer to read it necessarily. Oh, no, not at but all. It yeah. is a yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, a great read. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, proud of it. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Um, one thing. So, talking about the book, you talk about simplicity, and then when I was talking to Rimco, we talked a lot about clean code and mm -hmm. stuff as well. And I was interesting. Rimco was like was saying that he hadn't read anything um, opposing clean code. So he's like, maybe I'm biased, but I feel like clean code's a really good philosophy. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know if that there is a, I mean, there are other people that talk about that, but I don't think anybody really has any like conflicting uh, strategies versus clean code for how to write code. No. Well, I, I, I do know that some um, developers really don't like the, the way clean code talks about, um, about comments in the code. Mm. Because I think, if I'm, I'm correct, clean code says, okay, you don't want to write documentation 
the code should be so clear that you can read the code right. and not read the comments. Mm -hmm. And I think there is some discussion, OK, is this really what I want? I, I'm, I'm so used uh, to writing uh, comments that I can't live without. Personally, I think you can write perfectly good code without any comments, and you can just read the code. So you should have it descriptive. It takes a little bit more time, um, but it's way better because usually, I don't know, it, I think it's the same for you. Reading most of the time, you spend time reading code, not writing code, right? Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Uh, That's and, what I was going to say. That yeah. <laughs> so you read uh, for for quite a few minutes, then you write something, then you have to go back. Especially if you don't create applications from scratch, but work with existing applications, you read a lot more than you think. So the easier it is to read your code and to to understand directly the structure without having to read all the comments, the better it is. Yeah. Well, and it it's it's interesting because. A lot of times, developers prefer the greenfield, right? The, the making something from scratch. Yeah. But by definition, if a program is successful, then you are working with the existing code yes. and maintaining it, and that is going to be a much longer period of time than the initial writing. Oh yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It, it's 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 interesting from a psychological point of view versus the actual. You know, your goal is to make something that is durable. Yeah. And if that's your goal, yeah. then yeah, you want to yeah. make it. I, I heard a podcast the other day about uh, about legacy code, and they were making the argument that legacy code is great code because it's a legacy of something that has been te been tested that works uh, that's there for a long time. So legacy is actually a positive thing and, and not a negative thing. Yeah. Um, and that's the same indeed with all the the so the the comments and or clean code um, readable code. Uh, in legacy code is great because you know it works um, and you're even better off if it's also readable because then you can can understand it and make changes um, yeah. so I do like the principles of clean code I yeah. think I think some comments are good but yeah I can see where like uh, worth you know if too many comments would be a bad thing yeah so like well, it, it and it's it's also I think the the purpose so if you have a library doing um, some assembly stuff, for example, which is not not readable uh, directly, mm -hmm. then comments make sense, of course. But if you have just business logic, um, usually you can do without without clean co uh, without, without comments. Uh, co comments. Yeah. Well, and then you want to have comments at the um, barriers, right? So if you have a library that you're consuming from your application, you need comments explaining how the library works yeah. to the developer. Yeah. But then, like, yeah, the most of our development is at this top level, business yeah, logic yeah. type stuff, and that's, yeah. yeah. And it also has to do with something to do with how you structure your code. For example, I think we were talking about this yesterday or the day before, that if you have, for example, an if statement, um, so you have the if, uh, the comparison, and then the then. Right. And the comparison, it depends really on how you construct this. So if you always write your, uh, your comparisons with uh, if, a variable uh, is greater than something between quotes and something else, then do something. Right. It's um, more difficult to read than if you would say, OK, I start with a variable declaration. For example, uh, has manager, right. just, just an example. And after that, the comparison. And just say, OK, if has manager, then, which is way more uh, easy to read because it's just a natural flow. So yeah. you can just follow what's happening there. And I think one of these are the examples that um, are maybe a little bit more time consuming when you write them. Um, but once you've used it this way of coding um, and you see old code written in, in, in some other way where you have to interpret what's in between the if and then, right. it makes it way more difficult to read and to read fast. I think that's that's one of the things. Yeah. Well, it, so. Actually, I was thinking more about that when we talked about it yesterday. So one of the th complaints I've heard about the comments about comments is the that the code can change because hmm. that's what code does, yeah, yeah. A successful code, yes. and the comments don't necessarily get updated. Yeah. But then I was thinking about if you add those explainer variables, like so if you're like, oh, um, I'll declare if has manager and then declare it as this, mm -hmm. and then later this changes, then you have to, I think it's easier I think we're more likely to, in, to rename the variable right, yes. if it changes. But if it I does can, something else. If it does yeah, something yeah, else. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. at the same time, 
once it becomes part of the compiled process, then you have to change all instances of it. So yeah. it actually makes it a little harder to change. Yes, and still, I'd like the, the, the all the benefits of, of yeah. having that. Well, yeah, I agree. But I, I, agree. I, I know what you mean. Yeah, you still, of course, you have, still have to be aware that if you change the implementation of the declaration of the has manager mm -hmm. to something completely different, yeah, then you have to be uh, aware that you have to change the variable name, of course, as well. But I think the the step to do that is way easier than the step to to if you just change the implementation. Uh, to forget the the, the, the comment about uh, right. about this or some somewhere else. Because so. comment, I mean, <laughs> as I, I feel like as a developer, a lot of times, like I open up big libraries that have like a big comment block at the top. I just scroll to the bottom. Yeah. You know, I feel like we we become compilers. You know, <laughs> it's like comments. Yeah, just filter yeah. that out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't do anything. In the <laughs> it doesn't end. do anything. So, yeah, it, it, it makes it more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, I I, you know, it's interesting looking at old libraries that the where the um, they put all the changers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, changers. They hit all the yeah. in there. Yeah. It's an interesting idea, but I can see how it doesn't make sense today. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, I think it makes sense if you don't have a version control system. Yes. Um, which is something we still see sometimes. Uh, yeah. But uh, OK, uh, then it's better not to add these comments, but use a version control system, because you can always track down your changes. And it's the same, I think, with um, commenting out code. That's also a bad practice, I think. Yeah. So if there is something in there that's not been in use, just delete it and commit to your version control system. Why leave it in there? It doesn't really make any sense. If you nope. need to go back, then you can always have a look at that. So there are a lot of good practices in uh, with, with clean code um, that are really useful, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we were talking yesterday about clean code and some of the stuff like that. And we, we started talking about this idea that I really like about um, coming up with some sort of directory of libraries and add-ins for Delphi that um, somehow we have vetted or that something something along those ideas. And we're, not, we're still figuring that part out. But I really think that's a neat yeah. idea because I've there are some, other, some libraries out there. And I feel like those libraries either or other directories become a try and include everything. Yeah. Yeah. And which is cool. But then sometimes I got into things and like, well, this is not yeah, exactly. <laughs> gonna be useful for me, right? Or, or yeah. I, I'm nervous about using this. Yeah, or it's a risk because it's not uh, maintained anymore. Right. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. So you have a couple of these large lists where you see all kinds of, of libraries and, and components for Delphi. Um, and we also see this when we we get quite a lot of uh, old code from Delphi 5 and Delphi 7, which we, we upgrade to the latest Delphi version. And then you have sort of the same problem. You see a list of libraries, and you think, OK, uh, which of these are still maintained? Which of these are, are good and not? Um, and it's, I think it's even Im more important for a developer if you start using a new component right now that you make the right choice. So not just pick some something, because I think that is one of the problems if you have a large legacy in the bad sense, in this case, uh, system, <laughs> which is too old. Um, so maybe we should have another name for it. Not legacy, but something else. But anyway, uh, if you have an old Delphi system and you want to upgrade, you always are stuck on the components, usually. And that's something you want to prevent if you start using a component right now. So only pick from a list that is verified. And indeed, yeah, we're working on that. I think it's a great idea to, to have sort of a verified list of components that, OK, we use these a lot. We know they are upgraded. We know their the code quality is good. We know the documentation is good. You can safely use these. And there's, it's interesting actually because it's some, because we do so many upgrades, right? So we do have a an, an, we have a list of Quite like, ooh, yeah, yeah. that yeah. that's yeah. that's gonna be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And other ones were like, oh yeah, that one's no problem. Yeah. So we we do have a lot of uh, uh, in-house knowledge for, about around that sort of thing, but also yeah. the idea of trying to provides, it's going to be interesting because there is a lot of things like uh, documentation and stuff like that that are different attributes that may or may not, I mean, you, may, you might say this is a top tier, whatever that's going mm -hmm. to be called, but it might not have good documentation. Exactly. But for somebody else, it might be like, oh, well, documentation is really important to me. You're not important so, at all. So yeah. having that uh, in one place of reference is going to be like, really useful and Absolutely. good for the uh, Good for the community. Yes. And that, you know, it's interesting. I was just looking at um, uh, a lot of other languages have 
directories. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy to discover that because like for actually, I was trying to install an app on my phone the other day and yeah. this is annoying to me is that you go look in the thing and the, if when you think about from the Google Play Store point of view, Google's objective is they want to make the apps that make them the most money the most visible. Yeah. And that's apps that either have in-app purchase or advertising. Oh, yeah. And there are sometimes, if you dig, there are apps that have neither yeah. or that are reasonably priced that are really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. But they're Way not better than surface. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So I think yeah. having where our objective as GDK software is really on good maintainable code. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you think about it from a uh, you know, if if we make this as we make this list and someone sees this and then they do something and then later they hire us to maintain their code mm -hmm. and we're like, oh yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a good stuff. <laughs> they have to write one. They, yeah. they did the right. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, it really is self serving as well. But. I think so, yeah. But a curated list of, of these plugins, yeah. Would be helpful. So it's something that I'm looking forward to to, to compile um, together and see uh, see what we can do. Yeah, and maybe we'll get some suggestions for this as well. Yes, uh, we do see a lot, but of course we don't see everything. There's so much out there for Delphi as well that that um, yep. yeah you can't see everything and and we'll um, uh, we'll see how far we get with uh, with this. But I like the idea. Absolutely, I do too. Yeah, and then. Um, I mean, and the, I think I mean, we're going to do something, but de how m well it's received and the feedback we get yeah. will determine it, how big it becomes, I yes, suppose. Yes, absolutely. Because we already have like a pretty good list in yeah. terms of <laughs> that we're using. I think only going through the list is already quite a, quite a job. That's true, that's yeah. true, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, then another topic, but just yeah. out, out of Delphi. How, how do you like uh, the Netherlands so far? Because you've, you've been here before, I think, but just a couple of times. Yeah, I've been here in the Netherlands a few times. And a little bit been, longer. Yeah. Um, actually, I really like. It. Yeah, <laughs> I've uh, looked outside. <laughs> it, it is raining. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. um, I, so I no. lived near Seattle for a while, mm -hmm. and it's rainy there. Oh, um, and the rain doesn't bother me too much. Nah. But Idaho, where I live now, it doesn't get a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. So out of the two, I'd prefer I'd prefer more rain than being in a desert. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do like it quite a bit. That the. the so you're, sta you're staying at, at across the river, right? Yes. So every morning when you're here, you just go by um, the water bus, by, by water bus, yep. the ferry sort of, yeah, yeah, to go here, yeah, which is a nice nice trip, I think, to the office. I like all the bicycle infrastructure I see oh, too. Yeah. That's uh, something we don't see a lot of in the U.S. Just the walkability and bicycle infrastructure. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. a major plus in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, no, uh, I was. Just the morning when I was walking along, I was like, oh, yeah, I can see my little pool in here, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it is great. It is great. Yeah. No, awesome. Um, so we do have the, hopefully I get this post, we get this posted before that, but in Chicago, we're going to have uh, cases meeting there, yep. and we're going to have an event there, too. So we did the one in Boise. Yes. A while back yep. when you were visiting. Yep. So that's going to be cool. Hopefully do more of these. It's, it's interesting. So it, Delphi Summit had a good turnout. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting trying to get these smaller ones to get enough people to, yeah. to justify it. Yeah. Uh, which, if you can tap into the right groups, there people are there that want to do these. But then mm. getting them all together, all together, yeah, it's getting, investing some time. Yeah. Yeah, and it's getting harder to like the signal to noise ratio in in yes. online. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and that's that's also a thing. Um, there is so much uh, to to see online, and investing then the time to go to an an offline event to, to a real location um, is something that, that we were not used to with all this COVID stuff and now sort of it has to come back and I think once you've done that you see the benefits of it because and that's the same yeah we're organizing indeed now one in, in Chicago and maybe more in the US and I really hope to um, that we meet a lot of people in real life because then then you get the same interaction we talked about this lots a lot of time before but you get the, the, the a different interaction than just watching a webinar online. Mm -hmm. um, although they're valuable because it doesn't cost you too much time, um, it's even more valuable to, to meet in person. Yeah, so it's, a hybrid is the, the simplest solution. Yes. Actually, yeah. so that's an interesting thing. Um, I know the Brazil office has a lot of people not in the Brazil, it, the, it live no. in Brazil but don't work in the Brazil office. Are um, Here in the Netherlands, how, are most of your developers in the yes. office at least part-time? Uh, most of them are. Um, one or two are working remotely, but, but okay. most of the most of them are working uh, here in the office. 
And now some of them are hybrid, though. They do work yes. some days from yeah. home. Oh, yeah, most of, not most of them, but some of them are. Yeah, they're working three days from home, two days in the office, or the other way around. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is fine. Um, we 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 try to have at least uh, also with the the remote uh, developers here in the Netherlands. We try to to meet at least once every two three weeks um, here physical together. Mm -hmm. um, usually when we do the, the vivid days, the, the research days we have at uh, once every month. So vivid days are more likely to be in the office or more yes. likely to be remote? Okay. No, in the office. Because the then office. yeah, then you can talk about, okay, what, what are you going to research today? What are the things that you're working on? What are interesting ideas? And sometimes you get a, a combination of people uh, talking together and thinking, okay, wait, this is something we can do together. Mm -hmm. So you get this, this um, how do you say this? ID uh, combination thing right. where you collaboration get collaboration yep. where yep. you get better outcomes than if you would all do this remotely on your own uh, yeah. small research area. So yeah, we try to do this here in the office uh, altogether. Yeah, I know that like when I've done like paired programming type things when I'm in person with somebody mm -hmm. is way more effective than when they're yeah. remote. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which is seems weird. It seems counterintuitive almost, but yeah. Well, yeah, it, indeed. I don't know why, but. I think it's easier just to to nudge someone or to talk about what you see or remote pair programming is is difficult. It's possible, but it's more difficult. Yeah. I think that the probably it's the the fact that there's so much other stuff that could be pulling your attention when yeah. you're someplace else. You know, when you're it's just a window that you're yeah, looking so at. It's yeah. too easy to have other stuff popping up over here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that uh, yeah, and maybe also the nonverbal yep. non non. Yeah, the, these kind of signals that you miss if you um, if you do this remotely. I don't know. Yeah, we do it quite a lot. So so pair programming, and you always think, okay, two developers on one machine. Well, why? Because someone can do this in, on his own. Um, um, but you see that the solutions, if you do pair programming, the solutions are always way better, especially with difficult. If it's just just regular changes in an in an administrative application, for example, it's not really. Um, smart to do, but especially with the more difficult stuff, pair programming can really help. Like yeah. the library and architectural yes. type. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. What, it, what is, um, actually, what kind of things did, did GDK do as far as like, uh, I'm trying to think what the, do you, is it like an official policy for like library codes paired programming versus, or does, how does that fall out or how does it's, that happen? It's more um, decision made by the developers themselves, I think. Uh -huh. If they think, okay, this part is uh, something that can, can be better developed together with pair programming, then mm -hmm. they, they make a call to do that. Usually if they work together on one project, but on different areas and they say, okay, I need some help with this. Let's do a pair programming session for a couple of hours. Uh, so it's ultimately it's their decision, um, okay. and we we also see it's it's more intensive. So a full eight hours of pair programming uh, is a bit too much. Yeah. But a couple of hours focused pair programming will um, will be really beneficial yes. to, to yep. whatever you are working on. So that makes sense. Yeah. Do you, um, as far as like uh, like senior develop. So I know you had a lot of people who started here as interns. Yes. What is that? Um, how, how do you find the best way to, to manage that like difference between the senior developer versus the junior developer and yeah so, uh, uh, it, it's a good one indeed because if you if you have a really a junior developer with um, not much experience with Delphi and a senior developer who knows a lot then the mismatch is I think that that they are too far away mm -hmm. I think we talked about this maybe yeah. what, was it yesterday yeah, yeah we yeah. talked about this as well that that you um, but maybe you can explain this better. That that uh, what a junior knows, what a um, just a developer knows, and a senior developer knows in terms of best practices. Well, so my opinion. So I, I was the reason I was asking not to set this up, see this up for myself, but I just think it's interesting. I feel like so many times, so much times, mine. I have more of an academic knowledge of things, and so it's interesting talking to you that you know you're mm -hmm. managing teams, but. It feels like that the the junior developers like learning best practices, and then the um, intermediate developer knows the best practices and they do them and don't think about it. But then the senior developer understands why you do the best practices, and then they can make the choices when not to. So yeah, pairing a junior developer and a senior developer would be problematic because a junior developer would see yeah. a senior developer do something and they're like, oh yeah, I'm why? gonna do that. Yeah. And, yeah. Or why would you do that? Or why? Or why? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Where 
they need to be learning the it's like it's like if you're learning to drive you don't want to uh do a you know uh a ride along with an F1 racer. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Oh, exactly. so you pull the emergency yeah. brake and you're going in the corner? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, don't yeah. do that. <laughs> Talking about ideal lines uh, through a track? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no. Um, yeah, makes sense. No, actually, something completely non related. I hear you're a big board game fan, and that's yeah. talked to a lot of people here that are big <laughs> fans of board yeah. games as well. Yeah. What are some of your favorite board games? Oh, we have so many. Um, depends on who I'm playing with, I think. So I play a lot with my kids. And then I play like games like um, a Ticket to Ride, for example, or El Dorado, or well, mm -hmm. a lot more. Sometimes card games as well, and um, Machiavelli. And there are so many board games that I like. Um, for other groups, it's more like Dominion and these kind of uh, th sort of deck builders. Or yeah. So <sighs> it ranges a lot, and it depends a bit on who I'm playing with. Sure. Um, it was also fun indeed with the company days. We always get some board games and uh, bring them with us and have some some games uh, every night to uh, to play together. Uh, and you, I think you're I, a, I do a, like working. a fan as well, Dominion's right? a, a big f a favorite of mine as yeah. well. Um, actually, there's one that I I use as my gateway game is Flux. Have you played Flux? No. Whenever I'm introducing somebody to like uh, going beyond just like the uh, Uno and the Monopoly uh -huh. games, yeah. Flux is like kind of the ones I use for that because it's like really simple. And it was... The, I originally, the first one I got was to play with my kids. Mm -hmm. So the what thing about Flux is the the rules change. Right. So you have diff the cards you get in your hand, some of the cards are rule cards that you play yeah. that then change the yeah. objective and the rules of the game. Yeah. Because um, one of the problems I had with my kids was they would get really competitive in games. Mm -hmm. And because you, you, there's nobody winning until the game's over in yeah. Flux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you're, not, you're not ahead I until see. it's over. Yeah. And so that ended up being okay. kind of a cool one. I'll check it and out. And there's yeah. the interesting thing about Flux is they have a lot of different variations of it. Yeah. So there's Pirate Flux, Zombie Flux, uh, Space Flux. Yeah. And so yeah. whatever you're into, I think yeah. there's a Monty Python Flux, you know, so mm. you can usually find some variation of it that's, uh, that's different. Okay, for yeah, you. that's fun. Yeah. I play a lot of. Uh, Stuff. Actually, mm -hmm. if you got, you got time to talk about something else? Yeah. Okay, so I was talking to Rimco and this came up was the impact of uh, large language models mm. on the future of software development. What That's are your thoughts topic. <laughs> about that? Um, well, depending on the day, <laughs> I would say it's a, <laughs> it's a blessing or a curse maybe. I've talked about it before. I think it's, um, well, first of all, I think everyone uses it for um, figuring out what exactly the syntax of some, some thing was and instead of Googling it or using Stack Overflow, now using ChatGPT or something like that, Cloudy or another mm -hmm. service to, to quickly come up with some ideas or, or answers to, to some of the, of the, the development prob uh, problems that you have. Um, for the long run, I don't know. It's, um, with all these things, it's difficult to, to predict. Um, what will happen if they get smarter and smarter? Uh, right now, you you can just j throw in some code and it'll find bugs and it'll suggest improvements, etc. Um, but it still doesn't understand the the, the, the whole concept of a, a program. So if you have um, a somewhat bigger program, you can't just say, okay, here's my whole program, uh, find me some bugs or create some new page and, and add some stuff. So that's all not possible right now. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you see where we come from, from what is it, one and a half years since these, these things became yeah. a little bit more known, um, we've come quite far already and it doesn't look like it's slowing down. Um, one of the things I, I... Yeah, there are multiple ways you can you can uh, look at at a large language model and how that can uh, can be beneficial for a developer. Um, the problem for now is that all the code is still uh, too complex for them to understand fully. And yes, there are multiple easy ways where you can just ask and write some easy program to to program Flappy Bird or whatever, and it sort of works because it knows the sometimes knows the code as well and knows, mm -hmm. knows how to do that. Um, for the work space that we are in, um, it's, I think we're far, still far off from 
a NLM based developer that you can just say, okay, um, I have this problem, fix it. And this is, by the way, this is my code base, go ahead. I think um, that will take a while before we'll, we reach the level that we are just, let's say, as developers, prompt developers, where, right. we, where we write prompts instead of write code. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, if you, and that's, that's the difficulty with these predictions or with looking into the future, I wouldn't have thought that you could do so many things with the current LLMs one and a half year ago. Right. Then I thought, okay, yeah, this, it's interesting, but it's not that smart. And now, as you see how, how many times you use it for all kinds of things. So just to set up a, um, uh, for example, a program for uh, new Delphi developers to learn Delphi. Okay, what, what are the best practices? How do you get started with Delphi, et cetera? It just works. It, you get so many things out of that already. Uh, if you just drop some code, find me the bugs, improve it for smaller parts, it works. And if you look back for one and a half year ago, it couldn't do that. Um, the question is, and, and that is the difficulty, I think, is it, is, is it reaching a plateau or is it still increasing it exponentially? And I think, to be honest, nobody really knows what, what will happen in the next one and a half year. Um, but that our job can change, I'm quite sure of that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that you need to not only be a developer, but also need to know how these LLMs work and how you can, can craft almost craft, I think, good prompts to get good results. Um, I think that's for sure. So one of the things I, I read, I can't remember where, but I read somewhere is that the creativity of these LLMs um, are mainly based on the input you give them. So the cre creativity really rely, uh, sits in the prompt, not so much as in the LLM itself. Yes. You know, so, so the, the better the prompt is and the more creative the prompt is, the better an LLM will do, uh, and we'll, we'll work with that. So um, I don't think in the next five to ten years we'll all be unemployed because an LLM will take over or AI will take over our job. I don't think that that will be the case. But we, I, I, I think that we will use these LLMs way more than we do right now in just our day-to-day -day job. I think that as far as like the employment risk comes down to. I, I think there's going to be a skill issue in that you're going to have one developer with an LLM is going to be more productive than, you know, as productive as X developers yeah. without. And so yeah. if you aren't willing to learn how to use LLMs and understand yes. the, I mean, the it's one of the problems right now, for example, is like the code that you put into ChatGPT, mm. does that persist beyond, you know, yeah, of you know course, yeah, yeah, yeah. as far as like you, copyright and stuff like that. Yeah, you can have your own local models running, but they're yeah. not way, way less clever than, than uh, so, ChatGPT. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's a lot of skills and understanding about that that I think are really yes. the important thing. And plus, yeah. honestly, we're in an interesting space right now where the there are debates about the legality of some mm. of the stuff and the oh, yeah. copyright and stuff. And so that's going to be interesting to see where that falls Absolutely. out. Absolutely, yeah. I know but that I think still, if you, if you look at the, the unemployment indeed, they had the same um, problem back in the days when they switched from machine code to higher level languages. There were also discussions back then, I think in the 1950s or so, that they were saying, okay, now a developer can be 10 times more productive because it's so much easier to write code. Instead of all these, 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 these machine code stuff, you now have one developer doing way more. So we need less developers. But the opposite was true. Because you could, could write more, more code, more, you could do more things, we needed more developers. And that can be the case with these LLMs as well, because that you can do just do more with the time you have. Mm -hmm. We even need more developers because there are lots more ideas that now are available to, to everyone that weren't before. So again, I don't know, but... Uh, I feel like we've, there's been a bit of... Uh, as far as like just a consumer of software that understands software development. Mm. I feel like there's a lot of software out there I use that I don't feel like the people involved really understood the software they're writing. Yeah. And so I, I think there is a, I think there is a big gap right now in the what we need skill set and number of developers versus what is yeah. available. Yeah. Um, the trick is going to be that you don't have people making a decision where I like trying to think they don't need a developer, mm -hmm. they don't need someone that understands this, yeah. that they'll just use it and then you'll, that um, 
fitness, right? Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. What they make being able to actually solve it correctly, yeah. that gap will get huge. So, yeah, there's going to be as going to be interesting from a lot. There's a lot of other things beyond that, but I, I do think that it's going to be a. Uh, I think there it's going to be a useful tool for software developers. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's going I to think for, for many of us, it is already. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And you always have have to be careful indeed, as you said, not dropping some code in there that's not yours because you never know what's what will happen with the code that you drop in there. Um, but from for for general purpose questions and for general uh, library code, for example, that's that's not specific tied for us indeed to a customer. Uh, yeah, you can work with that, and, and it's beneficial, absolutely. But yeah, that, there is always there's a risk involved in that. Um, but instead, googling uh, a solution for a problem you have, or using Stack Overflow, using ChatGPT is easier usually. It is. Yeah. yeah. So, and yeah. well, then OpenAI just introduced their own search engine, which I haven't used yet. I got a, a mo message saying I was yeah. invited yeah. to use it. Um, I actually I was just reading an article. You're coming about dropping things into it about how there's people come up with a way to embed malicious prompts mm -hmm. in other things. And so if you drop this email into it and say, summarize this, it actually embeds a malicious, and that supposedly OpenAI has made some mitigations for this. But the idea is that it can there can be a malicious prompt hidden yeah. in the email yeah. or in the pictures yeah. too, that then tell ChatGPT, put something in its memory uh -huh. to tell it to then in the future change its behavior to maybe yeah. exfiltrate data from your account or something exactly. like that. Exactly, yeah. Which yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. again, it, it's actually, you know what? I was working with this company and they had a, um, they had hired some new IT guys that were, um, the manager didn't understand what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it turned out after a while that they were buying all these servers they, they needed for the company, but mm -hmm. they were then actually outsourcing they were reselling uh -huh. the resources, <laughs> yeah. and uh, pretty bad. And so I've seen that a lot. Where you, I've heard about it a lot. But this was somebody I knew personally. This happened with, where you get somebody that doesn't. Um, you know, you have somebody. I mean, we have to trust people to a degree. But when you completely don't understand what's going on, mm -hmm. then you can have problems where people have. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing that's going to happen with these large language models. You can think about them if you don't understand the way they work, if you don't understand what they're producing, exactly. and just yeah. trust it completely, yeah. it, that's not a good nah, it's, solution. Nah, it can be a risk, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Especially if, the, if you give uh, such a system internet access, and, um, and they, were, they were also talking about creating agents, for example, to do some things for you, uh, but then completely uh, autonomous, which then, if they have access to the internet, can be tricky because you, you can't really control what's happening. It, you can't peek under the hood. It's just a neural network doing things, and although it still comes down to predicting the next word or the next action, it's it's now at a level that you, you, it it might be difficult uh, to control. Um, and with internet access, yeah, I don't know. Yes, yeah. I'm not one of these these doom thinkers. Do you say it like that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. That that. Um, that I think that AI will take over the world and that we, we are completely helpless. But I, I think there are risks involved. And especially if you work within a company and just giving an AI some stuff to do and let it let it out loose. That can be can be tricky. Not right now, but in the future it can. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I yeah, it, it's it's definitely interesting time. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I am yeah. an optimist but also Prag pragmatically cautious yeah. too, and yeah. yeah, I think that there is. I think you should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there are risks that we're not. We don't. A lot of people don't think about. Yeah. But I'm certainly not like a do nothing, because yeah. it's too dangerous. Yeah. But it sounds like the rain's picked back up again, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of these days. Well, it's yeah. autumn in here in the Netherlands, so. Yeah, I, for some reason I was thinking I wasn't thinking it was autumn, and this morning I was looking at the leaves and thinking, man, why is the leaves? And I'm like, oh wait, it is autumn. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. my mind, so my birthday is in October. In my mind, October is when fall ah, starts. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, not here. But yeah, that's yeah. Not, <laughs> not the case. Not the case. All right, cool. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Yeah.